Welcome everyone to today's lecture on empirical software engineering. So what we are doing today is to take a couple of steps uh, holistic discipline and in particular considering a little bit the scientific side of uh, software engineering. So one hope I uh, do associate with today's lectures is uh, however that you not only have a little bit of an overview about what it means to do empirical research or to approach engineering problems from a more scientific perspective, but also that you um, will see that um, empirical research forms part also of uh, everyday uh, practice, especially in uh, companies. So we'll be showing later a couple of examples and I will be having a very quick quiz also at the end uh, where I'm showing you as part of some research endeavors um, giving you some some insights and where you can actually win something because my understanding is as, as far as I've been told this is today the concluding um, lecture. Now before we start just a couple of words about uh, myself so that you know who is uh, sitting <laughs> in front of you. So my name is Daniel, Daniel Mendes. I'm a professor for software engineering at Seoul Sweden at BTH at the software engineering department and next to that I'm heading the requirements engineering research division at uh, Fortis. Fortis is the Research and Transfer Institute. It's a, a governmentally owned a public and non-profit research and transfer institute um, situated in Bavaria, Munich, Germany. So anyway, uh, my research interest lies in uh, early stages of software uh, development with a particular focus on requirements engineering, um, how to efficiently handle requirements, software quality management and software process improvement. Uh, and we do this uh, research in these areas and a very close interaction with the relevant industries, which will give some rise to the importance of empirical research. Uh, but uh, more about that um, later when I'm showing some examples. Speaking of examples, what you can see here on the right side um, of the slide, um, some exemplary research networks and initiatives. Uh, many of the examples I'll be showing uh, later uh, emerge from those um, environments. Now, a last a very small remark. Um, I know that we are all sitting together in this and doing this remotely. And uh, no, I would like this uh, as far as possible to be uh, interactive, which means that should you have any question, should you have any remark, um, uh, whatever it is, uh, please don't hesitate sharing it with me, sharing it with the whole group. Uh, one remark on that note, um, I might not see if you type something in the chat. So please feel free to hit unmute and interrupt me anytime. You would do me a favor if some of you um, within the extent to which you feel comfortable would turn on the camera so that I see a little bit faces and don't talk towards the void. Uh, but um, however, if you feel uncomfortable with that, I'm of course um, also fine. So then I would say let's directly start. Um, I like to start and kick off this topic uh, typically with a small um, stupid example, but just to make a specific point. <laughs> so let me start with a very small um, example of that. Now, imagine the following situation, quite simple. Imagine the following situation. You have done your master's degree um, and you're working at a car manufacturer um, as a software engineer. Imagine uh, that you are working as a software engineer and developing a software intensive product. So what you see here is just two random examples, no preference giving whatsoever uh, of two cars and cars nowadays are software intensive uh, products. Uh, just to give you one example, the last figure I have seen was from the BMW 7 series having more than 120 million lines of software code. So this gives you a little bit of a feeling that it's truly software intensive. Now, imagine you have been working for many years developing or contributing to the development of one such car, in this case, for example, a BMW. And after the development and after the release, you are convinced and you do know for yourself that the car you have been developing is the best car ever built. You know that this car has the best driving performance among all the other cars and you have driven all the other cars comparable and you know it. And you do want the others also to know. You do want the rest of the world to know that this car is the best car ever built. Now you have essentially two options of approaching this. Number one, which we will be seeing later as and what we will be calling the rationalist argument, uh, one option is to convince everyone, to talk with everyone, to provide some arguments, some maybe scientific arguments, and maybe engaging some debates. Um, number two, you provide some empirical evidence. Because you're smart, you go for number two. Now, 
imagine the following situation. You remember that you have participated in maybe a research method course and that you know how to do some empirical studies, but maybe you didn't pay that much attention. So you grab a book and read through the book and look what are the empirical methods I can use. So you look up the book and flip through it and maybe looking for, I don't know, a difference making study or something like this. Uh, and you find uh, something called controlled experiment. You think, great, this is what something, this is something that works for medical research. So let me just choose, uh, choose a controlled experiment and provide some scientific evidence for that my car is the best ever. So you keep reading through the, through the textbook description of how to conduct a controlled experiment. And you see that every experiment should start with a research question. So you formulate your research question quite open because you're open-minded, which car has the best driving performance. And you keep reading and then you see something that, okay, you cannot provide a specific proof, but you can do it through what they call the falsification. So you have to infer a null hypothesis. And this is what you do. You say the null hypothesis is that there's no such difference, which you try to uh, reject. And you keep reading and see that you have to form to conduct a controlled experiment, I don't know, some, um, some, some tests performed on a group and control it with a control group. So you form uh, two different groups, the one for the treatment, the other one for the control group. And you also try to uh, use people, subjects, which we call, that are free of any bias. So you go for subjects to test that, uh, that have never driven a car before so that they are not biased. You teach them in a crash course of two hours in a rapid lecture how to drive put them in the cars, let them drive, let them fill out a small questionnaire. And at the very end, you throw some statistical methods at them to make some statistical tests exactly as it says in the textbook. And you get a number with P below 1%, which according to the textbooks, because you are below a threshold means it is statistically significant. Now, what could be wrong with that study? Anything? Everything. Of course, everything, everything I said could be wrong. Everything you could do wrong is wrong. And one simple thing to understand about empirical research is that we cannot simply take any methods out of a large, large toolbox and throw them at some random examples. And this is exactly the point of today. What I would like to do today is giving you a little bit of a bigger picture on what we mean by empirical software engineering. Um, more precisely, what I would like to do today is to recapitulate, at least in a nutshell, a little bit of a broader perspective on empirical software engineering or on software engineering as a scientific discipline and clarify some selected uh, principles, concepts, and, and very basic terms that are typically used in that area. Uh, before then, motivating why we need empiricism in software engineering research, and not only in research, but also in practice, and very end concluding by giving you some very hands-on um, specific examples that show you a little bit what you can do during your master's uh, course, but also during the time afterwards. So today we are not talking about uh, the how, how to do it. We will not be talking about very specific research methods, but instead motivating the what and the why. So what is it and why do we need it? So a little bit uh, or little word of advice at the beginning. This lecture is part of a, um, of a very, very large course where the introductory sessions take up to five or six hours. So I have it in a very compressed manner, as you can imagine. And I hope that I keep the time um, if you feel that I'm talking too long about something, just feel free to interact with me and push me a little bit forward. Now, let's directly start. Three uh, points today, what I would like to discuss. Number one, what is empirical software engineering? Number two, why do we need it? And number three, what are the perspectives in empirical software engineering as a research-centric discipline? Let's directly start with what is it? To understand what uh, empirical software engineering is and what the implications are, uh, I would like to take a couple of steps back and start um, at the very, very beginning, because empirical software engineering is always meant to be the scientific part or a scientific perspective we take on software engineering research. So let's talk about what science actually is. So what is science and what do you think is scientific? Anyone? Maybe our guest? Science is generation of new knowledge. Very good. Thank you very much. Generation of new knowledge. Truth is, it's a very, very difficult question. It's a very philosophical question. And truth is, there's no such point in time 
um, where suddenly we understood, okay, this is science and this is not science. This is scientific and this is not scientific. Um, to understand what science is, we need to consider it from a more historical perspective. In general, or very generally speaking, very abstract speaking, um, science is, as said already, thank you very much, generally understood as a human undertaking, so a human-made undertaking for the search of knowledge through the systematic application of scientific methods. So it's essentially a human undertaking for the search and for the understanding um, of reality, what is out there. Um, and as I said, um, it has to be considered in a more historical uh, perspective. And with every single contribution and the history of science is full of scientific discoveries and scientific revolutions, when with every such discovery, um, we did not, our, uh, not only improve our understanding about reality, about, for example, the universe, how the stars move, how the galaxies are formed, how microbiotics are formed, and so on and so forth, but also about scientific practice and therefore eventually also what science is. What you can see at the very bottom is just a random selection of um, well, some um, scholars that I found are uh, important to mention uh, more from a um, philosophical perspective. Um, um, ranging from others, Aristoteles to Karl Popper, um, but please note that um, if you ask anyone else in the Collegium, you would very likely get any different names, simply because we have many, many different scholars that have largely contributed to today's understanding of what science is. But just to give you some random examples or some examples um, from these scholars, uh, Aristoteles, living back then in times where the uh, philosophy was the very, very large umbrella uh, over all the scientific disciplines or the major scientific disciplines we know today, ranging from the biology over mathematics to physics. He himself, uh, I would say, uh, working more in the mathematics. Everyone, I think, knows this name, Aristoteles. Not many people really know what the major contributions maybe of Aristoteles were, but the outcome of his work uh, is still in use today. Whenever you work with logics, you work with very foundation that has been contributed by people like Aristoteles. One of the figures that was not as much uh, concerned with understanding the phenomena of nature, so how nature interacts, as much as he was concerned with understanding the nature of phenomena, so logic and logical inference. Uh, moving on over people like Francis Bacon, who was concerned with the concept of knowledge growth and how to infer benefits from knowledge growth over Voltaire. Voltaire living back then in very exciting times uh, of the French Enlightenment uh, and heavily contributing to the, essentially to the emancipation of science from gods and beliefs, um, essentially rejecting any scientific argument that was rooted in one form or the other on the assumption that there is a higher divine process which for the scientific discourse, especially back at that time, was very important. Uh, Immanuel Kant, um, a rather controversial figure, I would say, especially for his a little bit strange and mm, controversial views on maybe uh, the notion of morality, but still very famous for uh, introducing a system of ep epistemology. The epistemology means the theory of knowledge, um, describing what knowledge is, and how to capture knowledge in scientific theories. We will be talking later about the notion of scientific theories. Uh, Piaget, uh, I mentioned Piaget because he was the one introducing the era of constructivism. He is not as much a philosopher as he was a psychologist working in cognition. And it was his argument that made us understand that there is nothing objective about any scientific discovery. No matter how much you rely maybe on quantitative data next to qualitative data, just to give you one example, because this is something you will hear very often, very likely, and nothing is really objective about whatever you discover, because whenever you work on a scientific theory, you always have your own very own understanding about the universe, your own mental models that um, influence the way you build this theory. Karl Popper, finally, uh, I think every, every talk on research methods should include Karl Popper, uh, living in the times of the Vienna Circle and um, was one contributor in the sense of distinguishing science from non-science by introducing the so-called demarcation problem. He says that any theory to qualify as a scientific theory has to be falsifiable. So we will be talking uh, about essentially all contributions in one form or the other, but um, later on with some very specific examples. Now, uh, during the whole time of scientific discoveries, the scientific uh, practices and the research methods we have implied have changed a lot. 
But what, one thing that has not changed at all is the role and the relevance of empiricism um, in this discourse. So what's the, what does empiricism mean? Empiricism means nothing else than gaining knowledge through sensory experiences. Gaining knowledge, so making observations, uh, feeling, hearing, listening, tasting, anything that involves sensory experiences. In a nutshell, uh, I think empirical research or empiricism can be best paraphrased by the term show me, let me witness what you have seen or otherwise I don't believe you. In a nutshell, this is essentially empiricism. Back then, during the origins or the origins of early astronomers, all they had to make uh, at their disposal as a tool to make observations were the naked eye or maybe some, I don't know, rudimentary telescopes. While today we are able, here you just see a picture of a large Hadron Collider, collider able to reach out to entire different galaxies or to the level of subatomic particles. But the very essence is still the same, gaining knowledge through sensory experiences. Now, let's talk about knowledge, um, of knowledge and practice. So what is scientific knowledge? Scientific knowledge is our very own subjective understanding of reality. And we build knowledge or we try to capture knowledge via so-called scientific theories. We'll be talking about theories in a second, but let's still talk at least very briefly about uh, scientific practices. Now, to employ scientific practice, such as empirical research methods, there are certain postulates that are quite important to clarify. And just uh, a very few of them I would like to discuss now. Number one, obviously, if you work scientific in a scientific manner, there are certain rules, principles, norms, and institutions to follow these scientific principles. And to paint a very um, easy black-white picture, you can distinguish, um, let's say, the scientific communities or to divide them into two very basic camps. Number one is what we call rationalists or the rationalist arguments. Um, people working with rationalism or under this banner of rationalism uh, reason by argument. They provide logical inference, they provide mathematical uh, proofs, and they work uh, in the very essence by arguments, reasoning by argument. The counterpart of that what is, is what we call empiricism or empirical researchers, reasoning by sensory experiences, case studies, experiments, surveys, ethnographic studies, interviews, I don't know, you name it. We have a lot of tools at our disposal. Now there are two things I would like you to understand. So number, two, number one, um, essentially that, um, as I said at the very beginning, that um, these two camps, rationalist arguments or rationalism or empiricism, is nothing that is only exclusive to do research. This is nothing that is only for reserved for academics, uh, I don't know, working in the ivory tower, but you find this in everyday practice, uh, engineering practice. Uh, one software engineering example is um, quality assurance. So can you give me one example for a rationalist uh, quality assurance technique? Quality assurance following purely mathematical tools. You know any? Model checking is one example. Ever heard of model checking? Model checking is one tool that is used especially for the development of safety critical systems. You will find this primarily in, uh, in the avionics uh, sector at least. And model checking essentially says that I try to prove the correctness of my models towards the specifications. For example, I try to simulate my system and I try to prove mathematically speaking uh, the correctness by showing that it's free of deadlocks. So as one example. And the empirical counterpart would be testing. I have some assumptions about the outcome. I know what should happen and I test it. I test the system and, and check if what I think should come out is also the output of that system. Now, um, number two, I would like at least to increase the awareness is that many, many people out there who want you to believe that you have to decide either for one or the other, either for the rationalist argument or the empirical argument. And quite frankly, I have no idea why, but very often it tends to be um, the people working in the more theoretical notion and theoretical sphere uh, in software engineering, for example, people working with model checking who want to make you believe that it should be their camp uh, under which you should be working. Uh, and somehow uh, speaking also of empirical research in a slightly condescending way, and you will find this very, very often out there. So my question towards them is actually a quite simple one. Uh, would you rather bought an airplane that has been exclusively but thoroughly model checked or would you rather bought an airplane that has been exclusively but thoroughly tested? So simple as that. Truth is that is somewhere between both. 
So rationalists alone will never be able to advance the knowledge as we know it. And one analogy is that you can draw as between um, theoretical physics and experimental physics. And you have the same in computer science. You have theoretical computer science and the more experimental counterparts. Why? Because uh, what they use, the tools, the primary to, uh, tools that they use are mathematical tools. And um, they move within their very own mathematical realms. And it's very difficult to leave those realms, to leave the areas of what is known already. Which brings us to the empirical argument where we do empirical experiments, for example, or, or any kind of empirical research. But um, also there, uh, we cannot work truly empirically because at some point we need to use the tools of the rationalists. We have to work with logics. We have to work with statistics. So this is just to open up the whole discourse uh, of what, what we are talking. Now, a couple of more points, very briefly only. Um, one thing to, to recognize is there's nothing absolute about truth, which means that no matter how often I run an experiment, no off, how, matter, how, uh, how often I repeat any kind, any empirical study, there's nothing really absolute about truth. This is also the reason why we never talk about proofs. We will never empirically prove anything. I will show you this data also at a very specific example. We can increase the confidence in scientific theories. The more often we repeat some experiments, the more often we repeat our studies, the higher our confidence is, of course, uh, up to a level where it's commonly accepted. Think of uh, gravity, for example. Everyone accepts gravity. I don't see anyone jumping out of the window. Everyone accepts gravity. And there are, of course, other theories where our level of confidence is not that high. And number three, there's a scientific community to judge about the quality of empirical studies. Uh, as we said earlier, science is something man-made. Some science is a human undertaking. And wherever humans are involved, there are errors. So we have our own safeguards, which is done typically by the scientific community and the publication process. And number four, uh, author empirical observations may be faulty. It is still possible in the long run to make reliable observations and to falsify incorrect statements about reality, which a little bit has to do with, with the notion of realism. This is maybe not really important for today, but uh, still important to understand that also empirical studies can be faulty, but um, uh, with the notion of replication, we can correct these uh, incorrect measures, for example, to a certain extent. Now, Let's start talking about software engineering after this, this more broader introduction. So what is software engineering research and is it scientific? What do you think? Hey. Hey. <laughs> uh, I think that you, know, you just uh, told that there are uh, two types of uh, computer science, one which is theoretical and one which is uh, mathematical. I just think that it's uh, a bit of a theoretical scientific manner yes exactly so you have two sides uh, this is very true uh, you have two sides <laughs> i thought so i tend to make questions that are actually impossible to answer uh, and somehow you uh, two times in a row i failed so um very good so very in the very essence you ha you have not only two sides of the medal but you have also two sides of the medal of the purpose of science so if again we try to divide and distinguish a black white picture of science. Um, we have the more what we call basic science side or the more fundamental science, where we uh, deal with more insight oriented questions. And these questions where we try to understand what is out there. And these questions tend to be more answered uh, by the natural and the social sciences. Natural science, in our case, and computer science is more the mathematically oriented um, uh, natural science. It's a natural science. On the other side, we have what we call applied science, where we try to treat not knowledge problems, as on the basic science side, but more what we call design science problems, where we try to solve practical problems, for example, with new methods, new tools, new techniques, new software. And here we apply also scientific methods to practical ends. This has a more pragmatic character uh, and is typically addressed by engineering disciplines. In software engineering research, as you said, we address both. We apply scientific methods to practical ends primarily, but we have also to treat more insight-oriented questions. Therefore, we are also an insight-oriented science as well. So one example with some figures is where we talk about graph theory. There we have in theoretical computer science, we talk about graph theoretical problems, which we can bring to life, for example, as part of 
um, navigation systems trying to explore the shortest path possible. This is a typical example for the tr transition from more insight oriented questions to more applied questions. Another example, a little bit more tangible maybe, is global software engineering, to stay within software engineering, where we um, uh, where more insight oriented questions could be how software developers tend to communicate over different gates and what typical communication challenges might be, how they socially interact with each other in order to build on the applied side, tool, applied side tools and techniques in order to support this communication. So is software engineering research scientific? Oh yeah, by all means. Okay. Now, Let's talk and keep talking about software engineering to move towards the, what is a scientific discipline, a, a scientific theory, sorry, and then conclude this more introductory part. So what is software engineering? One thing to understand, uh, and this is what makes a difference between software engineering and other, and other engineering disciplines, is that um, software is a lot about development and rather than about mass production. So software is a lot about custom software development, not always, but primarily. And more important, software is extremely complex uh, and software is especially human centric, something that many people tend to forget. Software is made by human beings for human beings. If there's one thing we know about human beings is that their behavior is very much irrational, demanding for empirical research. And it's only empirical research that allows us to advance as a dis discipline, as a scientific discipline, in order on the one hand to reason about the discipline, to better understand what is going on out there, insight oriented questions, for example, how people communicate with each other, especially when they are globally distributed, but also to recognize and understand the, the sensitivity of the things we develop to practical contexts. So how well new methods, for example, engineering methods are perceived, how well they work. Just to give you one example. So, um, Exemplary questions I, I mentioned below, um, think of requirements engineering. We are reaching a point where we have over 200 published, at least over 200 published requirements elicitation techniques, ranging from data-driven techniques to more um, elaborate techniques, uh, labor-intensive techniques, sorry, um, 200. Quite a large number, let that sink in for a second. Now imagine you're working at a company and you have to decide which one to take. It's not, it's not as easy and it should never be just a gut feeling. But these are typical questions that you can address, for example, with empirical research, allowing you to answer which of these techniques work best and under which conditions in your very environment. Or think about your master thesis. You would like to develop something new, a new requirements elicitation technique or a quality assurance technique, a testing technique. Uh, at some point, you will have to provide some evidence, same as with the car example, provide some evidence that yours is better than others, but also that yours has certain limitations. And this is what we do with empirical research in software engineering. Now, the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal of empirical software engineering, where we employ empirical research methods to our own discipline from a more insight oriented perspective and an applied perspective is to build theories or what we call scientific theories. I will be talking about those in a second. And this is what uh, we use to capture what we call knowledge. Okay, so our understanding about reality captured via scientific theories. Um, one, one small thing I would still like to mention is the, the symbiotic relationship between, between theory and practice, which is something um, I think particularly important to software engineering research, at least compared to other uh, engineering disciplines. Very often we talk about things that are more concerned uh, by, by practitioners than by researchers. What we actually mean by that is that we have different questions that are more of applied character and different questions that are more of fundamental character. So typically in tendency, we have researchers that are more concerned about understanding the nature of the artifacts. So what is going on out of there? Uh, how are people communicating? Uh, what effects does a specific elicitation technique have, while practitioners or practice-oriented questions are more concerned with improving specific engineering practices. So which, which problems do we need to address? What is the criticality of these problems? Which uh, engineering methods can I use to solve these uh, problems? So empirical software engineering deals with both more applied and more fundamental questions in order to build um, or advance our knowledge and build scientific theories. Now, this brings me to the very last part of this more general, broader introduction. What is a scientific theory? 
So, <laughs> very good. So, let's first start uh, with a very general notion of uh, theories or what a theory is before talking about scientific theories. So, a theory is um, a general belief that there is a pat pattern and phenomenon. So, I make some observations and I construct um, some pattern out of this. Okay, so following this very general notion of theory or this very general example, anything can be a theory as long as we have someone made some observations. For example, vaccinations lead to autism. Uh, I don't know, Earth is flat. You, I think, I can assume where I'm going with this. Okay, uh, the world is full of them. If you are looking for these kind of theories, I can highly recommend to use Twitter uh, and look this up. Uh, Twitter is full of these theories. Now, key question is, are these theories scientific? No, of course not. These theories are more speculations, uh, imaginations, hopes, fears, uh, that very often cannot be refuted, which is exactly what you have said right now. They cannot be refuted and very often they rely on, on what we call logical fallacies. Um, I don't know, just to give you one random example uh, about a logical fallacy, um, vaccinations lead to this is definitely not intended as a joke, but the vaccinations lead to any kind of disease. Uh, you very often cannot blame the people who, who come up with these theories because they rely on their very own uh, observations. Think about the following situation. Um, a human being that is healthy, appears to be healthy, receives a vaccination and then develops any kind of uh, symptoms. What is the logical fallacy here that we fall into? We misunderstand correlation for causation. Uh, so it's not, of course, the vaccination to that leads to this serious, whatever it is, uh, but maybe at some point, at least, uh, the vaccination that maybe allows to extend their life expectancy so that the um, humans, in this case, the children, um, uh, uh, are actually able to develop whatever conditions it is rather than they may be dying out of polio. And you, the, the problem is, uh, I know this sounds very often as a joke about these theories, but the problem is that the world is full of these theories that are not scientific. At some point, um, at some point, the theories, as you have very well said, have to be uh, uh, refutable or refutable, essentially. Okay, many of them are, most of them are not because they're very high level and very speculative. And this is exactly what makes a scientific theory in contrast to uh, whatever notion of theory uh, we might use. A scientific theory is a belief that there is a pattern and phenomena while having survived multiple attempts for refutation. Okay, multiple tests against sensory experiences, which is exactly what we do in empirical software engineering. And this is exactly what Karl Popper has introduced as the so-called demarcation problem, saying that a theory that is not testable, a theory that is, cannot be challenged, can never be scientific. Now, uh, how can we challenge a theory? By running empirical tests. For example, an experiment, a simulation, a case study, whatever it is, and sometimes also replications. And number two, it has of also a have to survive, survived um, criticism by critical peers, uh, which is typically what we, what we paraphrase as um, a certain notion of uh, quality assurance, for example, peer review or acceptance uh, by the community and so on and so forth. Now, um, this is in scope typically uh, of empirical research methods. Whenever you open up your textbook descriptions of empirical research methods, you see how to do them, but not, ne not necessarily how they contribute to theory building, which is what we are talking now today. Let's keep talking about scientific theories and, and move on towards some uh, examples. So now, an uh, a scientific theory, let me just, one second, please. Let me just open the window because I'm being cooked here alive. Now, a scientific theory can have different, uh, different purposes. And this is very important to understand because the purpose describes how to build a theory. Um, one example for, for a, a scientific theory, for the purpose of a scientific theory is an analytical, um, analytical purpose. Now, analytical purpose is what is also very often known as law. Uh, law is typically used more in mathematics. A law is a purely uh, descriptive um, theory without any explanation. Analytical theories you find in software engineering very, very often in forms of concept models, meta models, ontologies, uh, or taxonomies, or any kind of classifications. What they do is they describe what is out there. So one example for an analytical theory is, for example, a classification of all problems that can occur in requirements engineering. 
It's a random example, but I will show you this example later again. So uh, an example for analytical theories, what can go wrong in requirements engineering. Now, moving forward, another purpose for a theory is an explanatory theory. An explanatory theory does show you not only uh, what is, but also what the root causes are. Uh, typically represented um, via cause-effect relationships. Now, an example for requirements engineering uh, would be to not show you only as a taxonomy which problems can occur in requirements engineering, but also which root causes these problems have in requirements engineering. Uh, another type of, uh, or NIAP, another purpose for a theory would be a predictive theory. This is something that is getting very, very strong in software engineering, where we have a lot of prediction models. They uh, describe not only what is happening right now, but also what the logical consequences uh, will be with a certain confidence, with a certain probability. So for example, in requirements engineering could be to say, uh, not only which problems you have, for example, communication problems, but also what the impact of these problems will be on the whole software development project. For example, problems in testing later on, or unclear, unmeasurable requirements. And then, there, of course, there are several different combinations of the different purposes. Now, other than that, you have different quality criteria for the theories, um, starting with testability. Testability is very important. Uh, if a theory is not testable, it's not scientific but also, of course, the empirical support, the level of confidence, which means that the more often I, I challenge the theory uh, unsuccessfully, the higher my confidence and that the theory holds, that it's true, and so on and so forth. The list is very, very long, uh, not subject for today. Now, let's talk about theories for software engineering and start talking about that. Now, if you want to describe a theory for software engineering, there are multiple ways of doing so. Or one framework for describing these theories is a framework provided by uh, Doug Schoberg, who essentially distinguishes um, four different entities of such a theory. Now, the first two ones being uh, the one that you use to describe the theory, and the, the, the third and the fourth one making the theory actually usable. Let me explain. And I will show you an example in a second. So uh, the first thing you need for a theory are what we call constructs. So the basic elements of the theory. So what are we talking about? So for example, if we talk about a theory for requirements engineering uh, problems, uh, the basic elements are the problems I name. Okay, it can be actors, can be technologies, activities, context factors, any kind of phenomena I try to capture in my theory. Number two, what we need is a proposition. The proposition is the glue between the constructs. Number three are the explanations that, that justify the existence of the propositions. And number four is the scope that describe essentially the, the conditional um, or the context assumptions I need for the theory. Now, what you can see here is an example for, for requirements engineering uh, theory. We have been building um, using, um, using emerging from a, a research initiative. I will show you this actually example uh, much later again. But what you can see here is we capture the theory. So you can see what we try to capture here is the theory using just the uh, um, um, very elements of uh, UML class diagram, just to keep it simple. Um, the whole of the picture is what we call the theory. Now, and the theory consists of different, different constructs, for example, actors, activities, and technologies. And what this theory describes is which practices are applied in requirements engineering. Okay, so which practices are applied out there in industry for requirements engineering. So we have, for example, different actors, among them the requirements engineer or a product manager, whatever it is, that conduct some activities for the documentation of requirements. And to document the requirements, we can use different, uh, we call it technologies, just to follow the terminology of Schoberg, um, several techniques, for example, requirements, documentation techniques. We can use natural language specifications for requirements. We can use any kind of different models, business process models, and so on and so forth. We can do this textually in natural language, semi-formally using, for example, class diagrams, or very formally using formal specifications. Now, these are the different things that can happen. These are everything that I can observe out there. The propositions are now the, um, are now the as I said earlier, the glue um, that uh, put these things together. So one example for a proposition is that requirement, I should have formulated this in active voice, but that requirements engineers document their requirements in structured requirements lists using natural language specifications or natural language. These are the constructs and the propositions. Why are they important? 
because I use the propositions later on to infer hypotheses. I will show you this in, uh, in a second again. The explanation in the scope is what makes it usable because not every requirements engineer, not always, of course, documents requirements, let alone in natural language, let alone in structured requirements lists. But we can make this observation for a very specific subset of the cases, in this case, in agile methods, for example. Whenever I follow agile methods, I tend to make this observation. And this is exactly what I need to build my hypothesis, okay? Now let's talk about theories and hypotheses to bring this picture together to something very larger. Now we have to distinguish a theory and a set of hypotheses. A theory is typically the conglomerate of different hypotheses that I want to test. And this is also important to understand. I never test a theory, but I always test the logical consequences of the theory by testing the hypothesis that make up the theory. To go back to the example, as I said earlier, this is the whole theory and it consists of different hypotheses. In our case, the propositions number one to 49. So 49 hypotheses to make up a rather simple theory for software engineering. Now, two final thoughts on that. Um, typically you find the hypothesis in the form, if there's any context assumption, then I can make an observation. This is something I can test. If I observe um, agile environments, um, Typically, uh, these requirements or the requirements are specified in natural language or in post-its or in user stories, you name it. Now, in order to test the theories, I can go, or in order to make a work with the theories, I can go multiple ways through, through them. I can either um, falsify them. In this case, I reject the theory or I reject the hypothesis and logical consequence of the theory or I can build up a theory, I can corroborate it, okay? And I do this by applying empirical research methods. I do this through empirical approaches. Now let's take a last step and bring this picture together to a more holistic view. Um, in order to apply, uh, and then we are finished with this more introductory view on the basic terminology. Now, in order to apply empirical approaches, in order to apply empirical research methods, I have to apply them in, on real world phenomena. Um, and as I can never uh, test the whole world, as I can never talk to all requirements engineers out there, uh, I will always draw what we call sample. I will always draw a specific subset of all the requirements engineers that I would like to, for example, interview. And I do so by formulating what we call sampling frame, where I characterize the units of analysis. So for example, I want to talk only to requirements engineers that work with agile methods, to give you this very example. Now, and once I have them, and once I have drawn my sample, I can apply my empirical approaches on them. And to do so, I can go multiple ways back and forth. And one way, uh, bottom up, oops, sorry, bottom up is what we call theory building. Uh, the proper name is induction or inductive logic or inductive inference, which means that uh, inference of a general rule from a particular case um, um, and a specific uh, observation. It means I go out there in case of, now, of the theory I've shown you on requirements engineering, I go out there, make observations in companies, how people document their requirements. I see some pattern and I develop my theory by building up these single different hypotheses. Now, the other way down is what we call to test the theories. The other way down is called deduction or deductive logic or deductive inference, which means application of a general rule to a particular case inferring a specific result, resembling the very basic notion of testing, which means that I have a hypothesis that says that under certain context assumptions, I can make some, or can have some expectations. And um, by applying empirical research method, I test these expectations if they hold or not. If they don't hold, I can reject the hypothesis and therefore the theory. Now, there's a just for the sake of completeness, there's a third view on that, which is called abduction, which means the creative synthesis of an explanatory case from a general rule and a particular result, which means uh, I make an observation and this observation cannot be true unless something else is true. This is something not really common in software engineering, but in other disciplines in physics, um, 
uh, for example, the discovery of uh, dark energy. This was one, one specific example for abduction. Um, um, scientists could observe the, the expansion of the universe, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, and this could not be true unless there was something else that they could not see, and it took many, many years to provide some um, evidence for what they identified back then as dark matter. So not, not really important for software engineering, but still for the sake of completeness. Now, two very final thoughts on this one. What you can see here is then the empirical life cycle, and there are multiple ways of going up and down. Now, whenever you use an empirical research method, it always finds its place on this very large map. Okay, Every empirical research method finds its place. It can be a case study, which I can do in an exploratory manner to make some observations, or in a confirmatory manner in order to test and to challenge existing hypotheses. It can be a controlled experiment. It can be a survey research. It can be ethnographic studies where I try to characterize my population. So every research method finds its place in a larger picture. And number two, um, as I indicated at least earlier, we can very easily falsify a theory, but we can never uh, uh, specifically prove a theory. Remember when I said there's nothing, uh, nothing absolute about truth. So why is it the case? Have you ever heard about the white swan example, white and black swan example? I'm not referring to the one uh, from economy, but so um, imagine the following situation. It's quite, quite simple. Um, imagine that you are sitting at a lake feeding the ducks and you see these beautiful, beautiful white swans. Okay. And you keep going every day there and every day you see these white swans. And every year and every year for the rest of your life, you see always white swans at the lake. So your very own theory you might come up is that all swans are white because you have never seen something different. You have always seen that all swans are white. So why can you never provide um, an empirical proof for that all swans are white? What would you need? to provide a proof that all swans are white. What do you think? Now we need to find another lake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, in the very essence, yes, you need to extend your, your sample, find another lake. Um, what you need for a, what we would call a proof, to prove, to demonstrate that all swans are white, you need to make an observation of all the swans that exist. But not only that, you also need to prove uh, and make an observation of all the swans that have ever existed and all the swans that will ever exist in the future, which is simply not possible. But it is sufficient to just make an observation of one black swan to refute the theory, to refute the hypothesis. And this is the reason that we say we can easily falsify a theory, but we can never provide a proof. We can only corroborate a theory. At some point, uh, when, we, when we have multiple attempts and we come always with, uh, to the same conclusion, make always the same observation, of course, we increase the level of confidence to the theory uh, in the theory that is sufficient for us to work, especially as engineers. Okay? So with this uh, introduction, I would like to conclude this more introductory part. Uh, there's one excellent article um, how could it be different? Written by me. There's one excellent article which you can find. I will add it then also to Canvas that gives you uh, this very introduction into theory building, theory evaluation, all the relevant terms, the whole epistemological setting of empirical software engineering as an emergent, emergent disciplines and what challenge we are facing right now. Great. So let me just check what time it is. Perfect. Perfectly in time. <laughs> so Let's start talking about why we need empirical software. Um, let's talk about why we need empirical software engineering before concluding with what the perspectives are in empirical software engineering. So just a very quick recap, as I said, so what the primary goal of empirical software engineering is building and evaluating theory uh, for our own advancement of research and practice. Okay. And the ultimate goal is to, buy, to build a reliable body of knowledge about two things uh, with more insight oriented questions about the discipline itself and all the phenomena involved, for example, how people communicate with each other, but also to understand what the limits and the effects of, of specific artifacts are in practical context. So any kind of technologies, techniques, processes, languages, tools, and so on and so forth.
And we do so by building scientific theories. But the key question, of course, is now which scientific theories do we have in software engineering? Do, do you know any? And if yes, which one do you know? <laughs> this is a trick question because there are not really many. So um, the, the picture right now is not that good <laughs> compared to other disciplines. And the, the reason is actually quite simple. Software engineering as a discipline is very, very young. We do exist for a little bit more than 50 years compared to any other uh, discipline, let alone uh, natural science, for example. Think of physics. In contrast to physics, we are very, very, very young. Um, we have uh, some selective theories, um, but they are not um, advanced or as advanced as they could and maybe should be. So we have, for example, one class of theories we have um, are the theories that we have um, taken from other disciplines without any uh, adoption. So one example, and the question is, of course, are they applicable? I do not know. So we have, for example, the theory of gatekeeping. The theory of gatekeeping is a theory uh, from which we borrowed from economy and which we use, for example, of, in the early days of the research on uh, global software engineering. The theory of gatekeeping just says that the larger an organization, the more units we have, uh, the more barriers we have for communication because we have gatekeepers, knowledge keepers, and we try to apply it as is um, to specific areas in software engineering. Now, another field uh, uh, or another example for theories we have are ones that are very, very vague, but that are very, very universal because they, they do not differentiate between different context factors. One such example, this was actually an example I was confronted with during my own PhD, was front-loading effort decreases the overall development cost. I mean, this is nonsense, but uh, it's still alive out there. Um, we have early work from Barry Beam, one of the pioneers of software engineering, who has made some excellent observations uh, by analyzing uh, NASA projects. And he has seen that those projects, here we are again, a correlation causation. We have uh, those projects that had invested major effort, um, uh, major activities and early stages working on requirements engineering had overall a higher efficiency in the development life cycle, of course. But um, if you look into this in more detail, this has nothing to do with effort but about the software process model used and so on. There are many, many factors playing a role. And um, finally, the last part, and this is the most dangerous part, is that we have theories or we have things that we treat as, as if they were facts, as if they were theories, but they are not backed up by scientific evidence at all whatsoever. One such example is go-to statements considered harmful. I will show you this example, this very example, um, in a second, because it's very interesting actually to look into that one. Now, the current state of evidence in software engineering, I like to compare it with a quote uh, from one of my favorite uh, philosophers of science, uh, Imre Lakatos. So Imre Lakatos said at one point that we are reaching a point where we are judging a theory by assessing the number, faith, and vocal energy of its supporters, which comes very close to the political credo of contemporary religious maniacs. So of course he was not talking about software engineering, um, but back then, it was uh, from the 70s or 1970, he was talking about, um, he was making some observations in the research community in physics and quantum mechanics um, and software engineering was founded two years earlier. So, but still, if you went, for example, uh, um, in the early days and the first uh, annual conventions of the agile software engineering community, it was very close to that. Uh, we had discussions that were more tough but very little evidence. Um, let me show you just one example. Uh, and this example is from requirements engineering and uh, please take it with a grain of salt, but just to give you a little bit an idea of where we are right now um, in software engineering. Now, goal-oriented requirements engineering, I just assume that it, you might, maybe not all of you heard of that. So goal-oriented requirements engineering is just a collection of different approaches to requirements engineering. And it's a collection of approaches that help you model high level goals and break them down and infer requirements from these goals. 
And you can do this in different ways uh, and different degrees of formalization. You can do this with predicate logic and you can do this in natural language. It doesn't really matter. Now, goal-oriented requirements engineering has become a very strong and vibrant research community with many, many contributions. So big that some years ago in 2016, a colleague from Chalmers, Jennifer Horkoff, decided to do a secondary study, so a literature study. And she analyzed all the papers published out there by academics and practitioners um, to, uh, proposing any techniques or evalu evaluating any techniques related to goal-oriented requirements engineering. And one of the things she came up was that back then already they had, we had very close to 1,000 scientific publications on goal-oriented requirements engineering alone. Let that sink in for a moment, 1,000 publications. Four years later, it will definitely not be less. Now, one of the things that caught my attention was that out of these 1,000, so she made some distinction and broke it a little bit more down and analyzed um, those papers in more detail that were, I think, at least two times cited or something like this. Doesn't really matter for us. But out of those papers, 131 were meant to include a case study. Now, let's say 13%, roughly 30% have a case study. I thought this was a lot because doing a case study is quite intensive and quite difficult to do. Until one year later, I saw a follow-up study done by colleagues from Rolls Royce and TU Munich, where they discovered uh, when they where they analyzed these case studies in more detail, and they saw that only 20 of those 131 case studies included a practitioner in one form or the other, which means that only 2% 2% of all the papers bothered with talking with those people who are meant to apply this technique in practice. And even more, one study uh, that I'm uh, leading together with colleagues, where we are surveying which practices are used in practice, which requirements, engineering techniques, I mean, are used in practice, only 5% of practitioners specify goals at all. 5%. Now, um, I'm not saying... <laughs> This is really just meant as a joke. I'm not saying that the um, that they are useless goal-oriented requirements engineering, but what we can say is that we have more Icelanders believing in the existence of elves than we have practitioners believing in the value of goal-oriented requirements engineering, which is funny because it's really stupid, but still true. Of course, what we can't say is that the practical value is low, but what we can say, and this holds not only for, for goal-oriented requirements engineering, but for many, many other things that we simply do not know because we lack evidence. We don't have yet sufficient evidence to say what works out there and what doesn't. Which brings me to the different stages or different levels of evidence. Now, what you can see here is just an exemplary a drawing of different possible um, stages or levels of evidence. Uh, we can talk about, uh, this is provided by Klaas Wolin in a great paper, which helps you a lot maybe understanding with um, uh, which different uh, um, forms of evidence and, and, and how, um, 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 levels of confidence, sorry, uh, we can have in a scientific theory. Now we talk about first or party, uh, uh, second party claims when we have made ourselves our observations. We talk about third party claims when not only we, but also others have made the same experiment, for example, the same observation and so on and so forth until we can reach the level of strong evidence where the whole scientific community just takes us as commonly accepted. And we can do so in favor of a theory when we talk about corroboration, but we can also do this, of course, against a theory when we talk about um, refuting a certain um, theory. Now, in most of the cases in software engineering, we are uh, on the positive side, but rather weak. So most of the theories we have, uh, and most uh, um, yeah, of the theories we have, are rather weak in the frame in, in the sense that we don't have much evidence in favor of them. And there are uh, many many reasons for that. We are not going too much into the reasons, but one thing that is quite important to understand is that we one thing we lack in contrast to any other discipline is that we lack. Uh, um, studies that report on negative results. A negative result is when I refute something. When I do a study um, and I, I, I cannot show, I cannot provide uh, empirical support uh, for a specific observation. But instead of publishing them, we just throw them to the bin and move on. And this is a problem because this leads to one thing we have, especially in software engineering, in its conventional wisdom. Now, there's one book I would like to recommend you 
Uh, it's the Leprechauns of Software Engineering, uh, written by, as you can imagine, a colleague from Ireland, um, reporting on the different Leprechauns, the different folkloric conventional wisdom that we have out there in software engineering, which means um, different um, theories that are not really scientific because they are not backed up by evidence and in fact some of which are simply wrong but they are treated as facts uh, only because they come from times um, where claims made by by authorities of our field like Dijkstra, Barry Beam and so on and so forth were treated as facts. Now the reasons for them are manifold and they are excellently written in this book so if you're looking for an interesting reading it's a lightweight reading uh, I can highly recommend that because uh, the author explains very well the different reasons and the different fallacies uh, that we can do as software engineering researchers leading to these uh, leprechauns but instead I would like to show you one example for a leprechaun in software engineering. Let's start with go-to statements. Does everyone know what go-to statements are? Maybe does anyone not know what go-to statements are? <laughs> now, go-to statements, um, I got to know go-to statements as um, what we called back then uh, jump instructions. And they come from times of functional programming. I just assume that not everyone isn't that much familiar with functional programming, but when I grow, uh, into software, grew into software engineering, there was not, not much uh, object orientation. And um, the very, very idea is quite simple. I have some labels in my software code and based on certain conditions, I jump from one place to the other place. Okay, good. So these are um, jump instructions or go-to statements. So uh, functional programming was back then in the time of software engineering, 68, end of the 60s, uh, was the paradigm to follow. And there was one very, very interesting uh, article written by Dijkstra, one of the pioneers of our field, uh, arguing that um, go-to statements were considered harmful. And this is very interesting for many, many reasons. Number one, because this was a rationalist argument only. And it uh, not only was one argument, but it led to a very interesting public exchange by different, different uh, scholars, all of them published in the communications of the ACM, the Association of Computing Machinery. This article, go to statements considered harmful, leading to a follow up article, a counter, oh, sorry, a counter argument, go to st statements considered harmful, considered harmful, leading again to another article, go to statements considered, considered harmful, considered harmful, considered harmful, and so on and so forth. And you can read this up actually in a Wikipedia article. This was very, very interesting because they brought up very interesting and very eloquent. Um, reasons uh, either in favor or again um, to consider go-to statements harmful or not. But it doesn't really matter how you see it and at which point you stand. Um, think about the following. Entire industries, for example, the avionics, have been uh, rooted on the concepts and the, and the, and the languages and func functional programming. And not only that, um, they have been built around this understanding that go-to statements should be avoided at any cost. I have had myself guidelines in my hand forbidding, for example, uh, go-to statements, or at least using them very, very, very carefully. Um, but this was still, uh, despite being such a well uh, eloquent uh, argument and reasoning by argument between different scholars, it remained at this level of just reasoning until nearly 50 years later, we had one empirical study, uh, mining software repositories, that challenged finally this, um, this uh, leprechaun, this conventional wisdom, where colleagues, uh, in this case led by Nagapan, uh, con conclude that they are not harmful. Okay, so if there's one key takeaway, it is that, uh, of course, the current state of evidence in software engineering is rather weak, rendering the transfer of our research outcomes to practice quite cumbersome, and where we are still dealing with a lot of leprechauns in software engineering, um, much conventional wisdom, little empirical evidence, but there is hope because we have a, a growing, a very interesting and growing uh, young and vibrant research community built a whole uh, around this concept of empirical software engineering. And this is what I would like to talk in the last concluding uh, part about, okay? Do you have any questions? Feel free to interrupt me anytime. I won't repeat this anymore, but just feel free to interrupt me anytime. Now, let's talk about the perspectives we have in empirical software engineering. So whenever I say 
uh, empirical software engineering uh, community. Uh, what I mean is, of course, the people behind that community. So here you can see uh, the picture of our annual meeting. Um, uh, in this case, uh, from 2018, I just have that picture because I was privileged of co-hosting it together with many, many con uh, many colleagues from the uh, community. Um, what you can see is a lot of uh, uh, smiling faces. Uh, what you cannot see uh, is very likely the reason it was around zero degrees. Nobody told us that we are taking a picture outside. So everyone was, I think, smiling because it was extremely cold. But what you can also not see is the sheer diverse disciplinary background of the people involved here. Uh, in contrast to many other communities or research fields in software engineering, um, here we have that everything that comes together. People uh, ranging from um, psychology and even within software engineering, we have people here, I'm not sure if you've seen my cursor, working uh, in requirements engineering, people working in, I don't know, uh, software architecture, metrics measurements, bit data analytics, and so on and so forth. So the people uh, or the community is very diverse from the perspective of um, their disciplinary background, but the goals and the perspectives are all the same. We share all the same goal, which is number one, to provide tools and methods for empirical research in order to, as a means to an end, establish strong and robust uh, software engineering theories, but also eradicate conventional wisdom. Now, the settings we are working on uh, could be more different um, this ranges from purely industrial settings to purely uh, academic uh, insight or, um, I'm sorry, um, 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 academic uh, uh, settings over a mix of both typically found in publicly funded research projects. The reason I'm showing you these typical settings is that I brought some examples from these settings just to motivate a little bit and show you what perspectives we have out there. Now, let me start with the very first example for a purely industrial setting for applying empirical research method. Now, this example I brought from a past um, academia industry collaboration I have been involved in. Um, we have been collaborating for many years with the company Siemens. I'm not sure if you know Siemens. Siemens is a very large company. Um, I think the last time I checked, it's I think 10 times the, si the size of Karlskrona, I would say. Very, very large, many, many employees. So, and Siemens is divided into many different uh, business units, working in, in from finance over medical research, for image processing tools they are building over um, power plants. Okay, so uh, it's a very diverse picture as many other companies as well. So, and Siemens back then has um, experienced uh, major, major internal transformations, building new business units, um, and so on and so forth, developing new methods, establishing new software development process models, and so on and so forth. At some point, they were interested because just by looking at the figures, they saw that they had major investments always into writing down requirements and dealing with somehow requirements, requirements engineering. At some point, they wanted to understand what the role and the relevance of requirements engineering is to their business success. So they were not really uh, interested that much in solving a particular problem, but in seeing if there is a problem. And I'm bringing this very example for the reason that it's a more exploratory study that has been carried out in industry. So something that you might maybe, I don't know, maybe not expect uh, from the beginning. So the goal was to find a, problem, a proper problem in order to solving it properly, if at all. Now, um, in the context of this collaboration, we had many different projects and uh, many different um, questions, uh, research questions. Among them, there was one research question that was, how does the customer satisfaction depend on requirements engineering? This is a little bit opportunistic, but the reason we asked for the relationship between the customer satisfaction, I'm showing you the results in a second, to requirements engineering is quite simple because customer satisfaction was one anchor point we had everywhere. In every business unit, in every different project, same as many other companies, um, Siemens was always measuring, at least to a certain degree, uh, whether the customers are satisfied or not. Well, this was done typically in, as part of product management. Now, what did we do? Um, I won't go too much into detail. I hope you understand. I think you will understand that I cannot show you the particularities of the project. But what we did there is uh, we conducted interviews and interviews to understand how customer satisfaction depend on factors and requirements engineering um, as a basis to draw some conclusions about the relevance of requirements engineering to overall business success. And this is the second reason I'm showing this you. This is purely qualitative research. 
There's no strong measurements, there's no repository mining, there's no big statistical mumbo jumbo, just pure, uh, pure uh, qualitative research to show you also there, maybe unexpected, what the relevance empirical research has now. Now, what we did was actually from the idea quite simple. We did um, check for any root cause uh, that, um, that a positive or a negative customer satisfaction might have and try to trace the whole path back to find if there are any phenomena in requirements engineering that might contribute positively or negatively to customer satisfaction. So for example, what we did is we interviewed the product manager because the product manager was the one to talk with the customer and asked, um, asked her, can you give us any examples for a positive or a negative customer satisfaction from the past? And then she meant, oh yeah, I remember we had just a project where the customer was not really satisfied. And they asked her, great, why? So why was the customer not satisfied? And then she said something like, yeah, well, because we had, you know, a time and budget overrun. So uh, we said, oh, well, great, thank you very much. So we went to the project manager and asked the project manager, hey, do you remember this project and why you had a, a budget and, and time overrun? I said, oh yeah, I remember very well, the tests failed. I said, oh, great. Then we went and talked to the test manager and asked the test manager, do you remember that project and why the test failed? And then they said something like, of course, uh, the requirements engineer didn't do their job. We didn't do the correct, we didn't have the correct requirements and therefore the tests failed. So what we did is step by step, asking us our way through the whole project, from project to project, to, from business unit to business unit to build these models. Looking in a simplified way from the study design like this, uh, <laughs> being then captured like that. This is, uh, to be honest with you, as dirty as it gets in our field, uh, before then being translated into proper, proper models that show you proper cause effect dependencies between all the, the phenomena. Now, I'm not going too much into detail uh, into that, let alone because the figures are also written in German, you might likely not uh, be able to read it, but we could discover despite working or maybe because of working with qualitative research, many, many different uh, insights. Some of them were not really surprising to us. When you're working in requirements engineering, some of the things you might expect, for example, that requirements engineering or the outcome, proper requirement specifications are the effective or a basis for an effective product planning, of course, or feature sizing, of course. Once I know my requirements, I know how to size them. I know how to plan my releases. I know how to prioritize my different uh, functions in a software system and so on and so forth. Risk management, of course. Some other things, however, I at least found still surprising. For example, increased stakeholder involvement. Sometimes the requirements were clear, but they still ran different workshops to talk with the customer continuously to keep them updated, to keep them intrinsically motivated in the project. So this is just one example, uh, not only for running empirical studies in industry, but also for doing a qualitative study as a very basis to decide upon the next steps on how to improve your own practices, how to develop new methods, tools, languages, and techniques for your engineering. Now, the second example uh, is a purely uh, academic example. Um, the second example comes from um, a, a working group that I'm co-hosting at IREP. IREP stands for International Requirements Engineering Board. It's a certification board for requirements engineers. And there, together with other, other colleagues, we run a couple of different empirical investigations um, for one specific reason, especially requirements engineering, maybe more than other subfields in software engineering, are heavily influenced by conventional wisdom. I showed you some exemplary leprechauns before, so requirements engineering is no different at least. And one of the challenges we have, think of goal-oriented requirements engineering, of course just one example, always to be taken with a grain of salt, but still an example. Uh, one of the challenges we have is that we don't know much about which research methods are of high practical relevance. <clears throat> so how valuable they are to practitioners. And in this context, we run different studies um, uh, within the research community. Among one, I would like to show you uh, very briefly in the following, which is the so-called NAPIA initiative, uh, aiming and exploring different practices and problems as they experienced out there in industry. Now, NAPIA stands for Naming the Pain in Requirements Engineering. We started that 10 years ago. And what we do is we 
um, run every two years one survey worldwide together with many, many different colleagues, 80 people from different universities and different research institutes in total. Uh, and we run it every second year uh, in order to build one theory about which practices are applied out there in industry and which problems might be associated with those practices. Now, one of the picture you have seen before when I've been talking about an exemplary theory for software engineering, this is the left picture. The right picture uh, is just associated with this, uh, just visualizing um, all the problems that we have experienced in requirements engineering, and more importantly than that, are the root causes for these problems. So why are we doing this? Because this helps us in steering what we call problem-driven research. This a better understanding what is going wrong and why it is going wrong helps us developing tools to hopefully mitigate these problems or avoid what is going wrong. Now, now we're coming to what I mentioned very, very early about the quiz. They had two options going this. Either I keep talking and talking and talking and showing you many, many different slides, or you can do it yourself and explore the data yourself. What I would like you to do now is please open up, if possible, your browser on your notebook. And we will end up doing, doing a small quiz where you can uh, win something. So do me a favor and first things first, do me a favor and please unmute yourself so that I can hear you typing and get some feedback from you. This doesn't take long, I promise. And I will not ask any one of you to speak up or something, okay? Once you open your browsers, please go on the website of our project. Uh, napire.org, N-A-P-I-R-E.org. Great. Now, this is the landing page. Once you come on the landing page, you have different. You have three different menu items on top. Uh, among them, you have one. It's the Napire data visualization. And the Napire data visualization. If you open this up, you can see two sub menus. One of them being explore the NAP Napire data. This exploring Napire data will bring you to one page where you can have an interactive data visualization where you can yourself explore which problems practitioners experience on there, which practices they apply, and so on and so forth. Now, please click on Napire data visualization and there explore Napire data. Thank you very much. So, once you go to the interactive data visualization, just a quick heads up what you see. Um, it's a landing page. It's a one pager. Okay. Um, whatever you want to explore, you will find on this very page. You don't have to jump between different pages. You can just scroll down and down and down. You will see first an overview, what which data you see, what the primary characteristics of the companies are, for example, which process models they apply, which practices they apply, which problems they have, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, of course, this shows the whole data set. This means this whole shows the whole sum of all the companies that have participated. If you are interested in blocking some results, which means that if you are interested in exploring, for example, um, what the problems are of very large companies or what the problems are of the companies working in the automotive sector or the avionics sector, or which of the problems or practices are that people apply when working agile, you need filters. The filter pane is on the left side on, the, on this page. You see this very small arrow on the left side? See it? Yeah. Click on that. So click on that to open the filter pane. Now, then you can see different, different filters which you can apply, for example, company characteristics, which means also the selection of different process models uh, or whatever you are interested in, okay? Once you have made your selection, you click on the bottom of apply filters, don't forget that, and then it shows only the data to which the filters apply. For example, only the data uh, of all the companies who said, yes, we are working agile. Now, <laughs> let me try this. Now, let's directly jump to the quiz. I would like you to find out the following just by using that filter panel and exploring the data. And you can, I said, you can win something. And, and this is true. I stole one of our favorite because they are very limited uh, sweaters, our third uh, uh, sweaters from the um, Ericsson Space Laboratory that we have built. And this is what I would like to give you in case you get this correctly. So the question is the following, quite simple. What is the most frequently stated problem 
companies face in requirements engineering when using a rather agile software development process model? Is it A, incomplete or hidden requirements? Is it B, unprecise, unmeasurable requirements? Or C, communication problems? And I would like to limit, I would like to limit the prize to the participants of the master's course. <laughs> but no worries, I have also something for you, my friend. <laughs> so what is the most frequently stated problem companies face in requirements engineering when working rather agile? You can, everything you need to know, you will find using the filter panel. So the first one to explore, the first one to get this, uh, just speak up. Is it A, incomplete or hidden requirements? Is it B, unprecise, unmeasurable requirements? Or is it C, communication problems? Um, I think it's incomplete or hidden requirements. You think or you know? <laughs> Have you uh, seen that? Yeah, I think uh, my answer is uh, incomplete or hidden requirements. To reveal it, it is incomplete, unmeasurable requirements. Very, very well done. Um, do me a favor, please, and drop me an email later. Okay. So that you, that you can get the prize, okay? So great, thank you very much. So let's conclude um, today's uh, lecture, today's intro lecture into empirical software engineering with a third example. I will keep this very, very short one, uh, but it's a publicly funded pr uh, research project. So one of the projects in this environment is the CERT project, the Software Engineering Rethought. This is what CERT stands for. And this is a very, very long going, a very impactful research project. The department is involved in doing. And the background is actually quite simple. So as I said earlier, the empirical software engineering community is already quite strong and, and, and vibrating. And you know, we are doing our, the best we can to eradicate conventional wisdom and to propose new scientific theories. And we are going uh, already somewhere. And yet we are already now um, facing actually new challenges uh, over the last five to 10 years, which is that we see um, um, a, a very strong rise in data centricity and automation. Think of big data. Uh, we have a strong rise in the need for more value orientation and value creation at the side of the companies and human centricity. Think of human centric engineering and the role and relevance of human beings uh, for the use of very large and complex software systems. So the goal, the intended goal of this research project is to extend uh, not only our research methods, but also um, our, uh, um, um, our research contributions and the tools and the methods we develop for this, what we call next generation software engineering uh, problems. And again, I will not go too much into detail and talk uh, about this too much because I think we are talking already very long and reaching the end. Um, but I would like to motivate you to at some time explore the website rethought.se where you can find not only interesting readings, but also a collection of videos from talks and keynotes we are giving on different conferences from the project itself. So one thing that is very, very special to this project is that we uh, are working together with the relevant industry, uh, relevant industries, I should say, um, in the Swedish um, uh, um, geographical area. And the idea is that we are not um, working only on one specific topic, or one specific disciplinary question. We are not, um, as a colleague of ours said, we are not married by convenience to that specific topic and have to work for the next couple of years for that topic, but we are just working with the companies and the companies dictate the challenges we try to solve from a research perspective. And why am I showing you this? Because this project environment gives a lot of potential to doing many different studies and many different um, uh, research courses and, for example, also master thesis. So at some point, this will be hopefully interesting also to you. So and with this, I would like to conclude today already. Uh, if there are certain key takeaways I would like you to take with you, it is that empirical research is very important to turn our discipline, our engineering discipline into a more scientific one. Um, the state of evidence is still weak, but there is still hope because uh, there's a, a, a strong and vibrant uh, research community 
uh, growing that gives a lot of opportunities uh, for us as researchers, for practitioners, and also for you on the way to your master's degree. So if you're interested anytime to know a little bit more, uh, please, please drop by, uh, well, as long as the campus is closed, drop us an email. Uh, we are more than happy to talk to you and show you a little bit, a little bit more at any time. So thank you very much for your attention. This is pretty much it. We still have time for questions, if any.